Welcome to the May live stream show. I am your host, the man with more mustache than good sense, Burlington Showtime, here to bring you some amazing experiences. We've got some full shows coming to you from uh, Starlight Radio Dreams, two full short, uh, two full serials coming to you tonight, as well as a raft of short pieces. I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Uh, and for my part, I am just thrilled to be getting a little bit closer to back to our normal form. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I've been making a great deal of business out of my cat's business. Uh, keeping busy is important, as we all know, and here at Starlight Headquarters, uh, my uh, study here at House Showtime, uh, Archimedes has been keeping me well entertained, and I've got to tell you, I have spent more time imagining the activities of my cat than is probably healthy. And when it comes right down to it, I suspect a lot of other people are as well, including one of our writers, because our next piece is going to uh, give you a little something special with Business Catsule. Enjoy this first piece. All right, is everyone here? Whiskers? Morning, Tiger. How's it going, Whiskers? You know, living the dream. How about you? Ugh, kids are coughing up hairballs. Both of them? Yeah, they they just want attention. How's your Zoom connection? It's fine. I had a meeting with Snowball yesterday. He decided to use the litter box while we were going over the April finance. Ew. He forgot his video was on too. Oh, no! Yep. All right, all right. Uh, Simba, I see you're on now. Patches, good. Little Miss Oreo shakes, great. Where, uh, who are we missing? Where's Fluffy? I think his meeting's running late. Which meeting? With the scratching post. Oh, right, right, right. Well, that is important. Uh, all right, I'll just fill him in when we're done here. All right, gang. Uh, okay, thank you as always for joining me this morning. Good morning. Yes, uh, good morning, Patches. Thank you all for joining me this morning. Uh, so, as some of you may know, I have received word, uh, and this is directly from Mr. Strawberry himself, there are plans to open up the office for regular business hours as early as next month. Tiger. Yes, yeah, Simba. Sorry, it's Whiskers. What? Sorry. Uh, sorry, Simba. I thought it was you talking. It's me. It's Whiskers. No, I didn't say anything. Hi, Simba. Uh, Hi, so Tiger. We need, oh, sorry. Tiger. It's okay, Simba. No, Tiger, it's Whiskers. Sorry, I, I was talking to... Never mind. Uh, so anyway, with the office reopening, we're going to need to switch to a more granular approach for the first few weeks. Tiger! Uh, yes, Whiskers. Sorry, but should the office really be reopening so soon? Yes, please. I have been knocking my own coffee mug off the desk for 97 days now. My wife keeps hanging the toilet paper so it comes out under the roll. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? Yes, good point. Exactly. I gotta get back to the office bathrooms and fill them up with ripped up toilet paper. Reception's gotta be full of delivery boxes by now. We need those boxes. Yes. We need them. Okay, okay can I we get... Just... Uh... Sorry. Go ahead. No, you were talking. Okay, uh, we're running a bit late, so I I'm gonna jump ahead. The Jenkins account, uh, David with Protarian is gonna be in the office on Wednesday, so we'll need someone to drop a dead bird in front of him. At, uh, 9 a.m. I can do I that. Can't... Oh. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and have Patches handle that. I can crawl into his lap while he's reading if you want. Mm hmm HR says we can't do that anymore. Welcome to Nazi Germany, everybody. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I've, I've got to hop onto a pre-meeting in two minutes, so let me see. Tiger. Should we really be opening the office so soon? Oh my god. We are an essential business, Whiskers. Are we, though? Um, we catch mice, Whiskers. Well, we sell futures in mouse catching, which are then outsourced to undocumented immigrants who work for below poverty wages, and then we funnel those profits back into our investors who spend the money on stock buybacks, impoverishing the national economy even as they centralize their power in hyper-privatized pseudo-nations based on personal wealth that they pirated from our lendees, which they in turn pirated from the labor force. Yeah, we catch mice. 
more importantly, my birthday is next month, and if I don't get a big uncomfortable party with seven people awkwardly singing happy birthday in a dull, lifeless monotone so they can score a tiny half slice of bland, mass-produced cake, I'm gonna lose my shit. Tiger, I'm sorry, but can you at least talk to Strawberry about this? Tiger? Oh, did he? I think he left for the other meeting. Okay, listen, are you two really so unconcerned about your own safety? The safety of others? Simba? Patches? Oh, I guess we're done. Hi, everybody. what I miss? Hey, Fluffy. We just ended, I guess. How was the meeting with the scratching post? Shit, I don't know. I've been high off my ass since 6 a.m. Cool. Well, yep. See ya. <sighs> Hang in there, baby. <laughs> See, now that's entertainment. I'm so glad to be back. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I have, uh, I've heard that a lot of people are getting into crafts. Have you gotten into crafting, making weird things? Everybody's baking now. It feels like we're taking a trip back in time. Next, I'm going to hear that corn husk dolls are back in fashion or uh, wearing clothes that only have buttons because they look interesting, you know, like the pilgrims. But um, I've been getting into crafts as well, craft cocktails. I'm also making lots of noises when I stand up from sitting down for too long. Shirley's been mentioning that a lot. But not everyone can be a genius, you know? Uh, so, uh, speaking of trips back in time, we've got another serial coming up for you. This one's going to be absolutely uh, just a thrill. I think you're going to really enjoy it. This one comes to us from the, from the weird world of weird worlds. That's all they gave me. So here you are. I hope you enjoy Time Bridge. Coming this fall, the Showtime Podcast Network. Doug was just your average hardworking American. I'm going to be late for work. With an average American car. Come on, come on, start you stupid thing. <laughs> Finally. Who normally takes the average route to work. Oh no, I'm 15 minutes behind schedule. I'll have to take a shortcut. But Doug is about to learn... All I have to do is cross this bridge, and I should be able to make it. ...that his average life... Oh, what's going on? ...is about to be turned upside down. What happened? Where am I? By the Lord's year, 1720, what be this metallic creature that hast ridden across our rustic, yet of the time, bridge? Uh, oh... Find out on another episode of Time Bridge. Dear God in heaven, I do believe there's a person in the beast. Ah, good going, Doug. Now you're definitely going to be late. Dost thou require assistance? No, I'm fine. It's just a car. A car? You see, I, I'm from the future. I drove across this bridge, which brought me back in time. The future? Good heavens. Be ye sent from the Lord with a warning? No, I got lost. My GPS on my iPhone told me this was a shortcut to work. G. P. S. iPhone. What are these words? Shoot. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get some 5G service so I can show you the World Wide Web. World Wide Web? Be there giant spiders? No, no, um... Hey, Siri, can you- He speaks into his handbox! Make him stop! Dear Lord, make him stop! Be ye sent by the underworlds? Tools of Satan, they are. You've really done it this time, Doug. You've ruined history! Uh, listen, my early American friends, I- Ah, uh, we've got thee! Thou hast been fooled! What? We were merely playing with your natural assumptions. Do you think you are truly the first jackass to drive over this bridge? Hold on. You're not terrified of the future? Get over thyself. 
We just hang around here and wait for idiots to drive over the bridge, and then we mug them and take all their future things. We've almost enough cars for the entire village now. We only need but one more. <laughs> oh boy, Doug. Looks like you've done it again. What will happen to Doug? Will he make it to work on time? How will having advanced technology in the past affect the future of America? Find out next time, or not, on Time Bridge. <sighs> Isn't that lovely? I just needed to calm down. It occurred to me that I was getting far too excited. And while I'm thrilled that you can see me and that I can kind of see you in the chat when I'm not on screen, I needed to breathe for a moment and remind myself that I am Burlington Showtime, showman extraordinaire, and I'm here to give you a show, not to be a show. So, friends, welcome to my study. See all the books behind me? They're full of in knowledge. Some of them I've read. And uh, it brings me to the question for this next segment while we're listening. What books have you been reading during this time? I'm sure some of us have had extra time to do things. Not me, I'm busy preparing for this, but uh, if you've been reading an interesting book, tell us about it in the comments and we'll talk about it afterward. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this most recent update from Professor Edmund Zunderfell, which despite last month's episode, we are still allowing to submit things. Who knew? Ah, Master Showtime. You've caught me updating my Shakespeare Conspiracy Theories website. I confess I'm a little behind the schedule. A Shakespeare Conspiracy Theories, or Shakespeare-acy Theories, have a tendency to encourage deep dives, you know. You start off reading bad poetry by Sir Francis Bacon, the next thing you know you're comparing the dimensions of Big Ben to the Pyramid of Mazatlan. Did you know? Burlington, that Shakespeare's Richard III was inspired not by the last Plantagenet king, but rather by Sir Robert Cecil, first Earl of Salisbury and spy master to Queen Elizabeth II. Now, I know what you're thinking. Everyone knows that Zunderfell. Do you take me for a Cambridge dunce? <laughs> Fair enough. But let me whet your beak with this juicy Easter egg. Did you know? Burlington, that Romeo and Juliet features a minor character named Petruchio, who attends the Capulet's ball and witnesses Tybalt's duel with Mercutio. Experts will allege this young Petruchio is the son of Kate and Petruchio from Taming of the Shrew. The Capulets mention attending the wedding of Lucentio years ago, another shrew character. Sounds wacky, no? Well... I'm just getting whacked up! Did you know, for example, Burlington, that Mercutio has a brother named Valentine? An attentive student might say, Valentine? That's one of those gentlemen from the two gentlemen of Verona. To which I say, why stop there? It's also the name of a minor lord in Twelfth Night, and when I speak of Twelfth Night, you know what that means. Antonio. Twelfth Night, The Tempest, Much Ado, Two Gents, The Merchant of Venice, and perhaps even Julius Caesar and Antonio and Cleopatra. Shakespeare's work is absolutely replete with Antonios. Some might say it's simply a common name, but I say Shakespeare is laying the work for his own cinematic universe, featuring crossovers all over Italy and even the mythical realm of Illyria. Now, I know what you're thinking. Venice and Verona are all well and good, but Julius Caesar takes place in ancient Rome. Checkmate, globeheads! To which I say, you fool! Do you not realize this is hardly the only instance of Shakespearean time travel? Have you forgotten Sir John Falstaff? Truly the Thanos of the Shakespearean cinematic universe. We first meet Falstaff during Hotspur's Rebellion in the early 1400s. When next we see him, he's gallivanting with the Merry Wives of Windsor on the eve of the 17th century. 
Is this Falstaff some sort of Highlander-esque immortal? Nay, good Burlington, rather, he is the evil master to Antonio's Doctor Who. Whether debauching young kings in the late medieval era, or cuckolding established town elders, the evil Falstaff sows chaos wherever he doth wander. It is up to our poor Antonio to right his many wrongs. Now, I grant you, Burlington. Antonio does take a rather villainous turn in The Tempest. Perhaps more of a Capaldian Antonio there, or Doctor Who-tonio, as we Shakespeare-y theorists call him. Yet, in his other works, the bard gives us a naive, passionate, Tom Baker-esque Antonio, a man who loves, not wisely, but too well. We Shakespeare's theorists continue to scour the records for proof of the Bard's lost final plays. The British Civil War and the Merry Merchants of Athens end game, which we believe will tie up all loose ends in a climax so historic as to render all literature impotent by comparison. The end of history plays. An end which the man doesn't want you to see. An end heretofore obfuscated by a vast conspiracy of Oxfordian assassins that goes all the way to the top. Meghan Markle herself. Ah, forgive me, uh, I fear my references have gotten away from me. Uh, we Shakespeare theorists are nothing if not passionate. If you'll excuse me, Burlington, I really must get back to my work. Uh, uh, my niece told me JavaScript was the easiest way to keep a website up to date. Uh, that proved to be false. Farewell, Burlington. <laughs> All right. Uh, I suppose that makes good sense. And it looks as though the, you a lot have been getting some good reading in. We got uh, a story about a family with 14 children and six schizophrenic sons. That does sound harrowing and and a book by karen slaughter i feel as though karen slaughter is the the natural uh, enemy of pop culture in this year uh which as much as we've been uh, berating people named karen it is still a funny name so i hope that book is fabulous though it sounded really interesting i may have to look up something by karen slaughter as you can see, I don't have a whole other, uh, lot of paperbacks behind me, so perhaps I should uh, change that and see what we can find. Uh, I also enjoy that one of you is just finishing a sandwich. That's, that's meritorious as well. There's nothing wrong with a good sandwich. Or a bad sandwich, unless there's something wrong with it. Yep, that's what I'm going with. Let's see. Oh, speaking of the study and the books behind me, I've been thinking about making some changes to the study. Most notably, I think a wet bar, right, right over there. Uh, just so that I can get a glass of water without going to the kitchen and being asked by my wife where I'm going, uh, and then being forced to get her a glass of water at the same time. It's, it's truly a trying experience, and I think we can all understand a need to uh, remove that kind of trial from our lives in these trying times. Truly, I am beset. Speaking of... Uh, let's enjoy this new, uh, show called A Lair with Flair, which I'm told is all about architecture and remodeling. So that sounds good. Hello all, and welcome to A Lair with Flair, the podcast where I interview the architects behind some of the world's most notorious evil lairs, and I'm your host, Arthur Kilgore, and I get a rush from exposition-heavy introductions. My guest today is someone I'm very excited to introduce. Their work includes layers for the likes of Teenage Recluse, The Nickel Nuisance, and Dr. Depth. I am, of course, talking of the accomplished Olivia Hawke. Thank you, Arthur. You are so kind. I'm a fan of your podcast and all the programming here on NPR, Nefarious Public Radio. Wow, that, that means so much to know that you're a fan of the show. I've admired your work from a young age. The giant parking meter you built for the nickel nuisance? A stroke of genius. You even built a lair so enticing you made teenage recluse move out of their parents' basement. I have had a lot of amazing experiences in my line of work. It means a lot to have my work recognized. Thank you. Of course. You're a legend. What would you say are some of the highlights of your career? 
Mm, great question. Well, to be honest, you know, there are the layers that everyone remembers. Ah, giant legumes jar of doom. The evil baby's crib of crime. But I look back most fondly on the layers that were challenges to build, not just clever puns. Well, then perhaps we can talk about one that was a challenge, but also netted you a great deal of notoriety. Dr. Depth's Undersea Labyrinth. Ah, yes, Dr. Depth. Now that does take me back. I can imagine. Dr. Depth's Undersea Labyrinth was a triumph, and- Triumph! Ha! Um, what? The real triumph was working past Dr. Depth's insane demands and general man-child behavior. What sort of insane demands? I mean, surely you aren't referring to the shark room, which was famously a room that was just a shark. Like, all of it is a shark. You step in. Shark. The shark room was one of the saner thoughts put forward. Look, I've been designing these layers for decades. I am no stranger to the eccentricities of the clientele. So believe me when I tell you that Dr. Depth was nuts. Oh, wow, that's... He wanted me to build the whole thing in space, then drop it into the ocean to make a splash on his enemies. And when I asked why, he said to get back at Tyler Hobart, who splashed him at summer camp when they were eight. Oh, wow, that does sound illogical, I guess. Illogical? Try idiotic. He wanted me to build him a labyrinth made of glass, by the way, and then drop it from orbit. Glass. You know, famous for shattering when dropped. Glass! That does sound pretty dumb. Well, at least I won't have to see him again. Uh... What? We have a special surprise guest for you. Dr. Depth! Why don't you, uh, come on out there, Dr. Depth? It was not stupid. Oh, great. I apologize, Ms. Hawk. I thought... Apologize not to this hag, plebeian. Really? Name-calling? Olivia Hawk, you have crossed a line. I could forgive some of your mockery due to how well you made the shark room, but I cannot overlook you trivializing the great nautical transgression at Autica Lake. Oh my goodness, great transgression. Ralph, you were children at summer camp and you got splashed. Get over it. Do not use that name to me. That does it. Olivia Hawk, I declare you my nemesis. I shall construct for you a new labyrinth designed solely to torture you with the failures and shortcomings of your miserable life. Oh yeah? Who's gonna build it? Mm, well, are, are, are you not free? Like, can I make an appointment, or...? I'm not going to build my own death labyrinth, Ralph. Very well. You have bested me this time, Olivia Hawk! Not to interrupt. Well, no, actually, completely to interrupt. We are out of time for this episode of A Lair with Flair. Thank you again to Olivia Hawk and Dr. Depth. Security is on their way to escort you to your car. I hope we keep that one around. That was charming. Plus the, um, you know, the, the tone of it seems very, very calming. Like the sort of thing you could listen to and then wake up very suddenly at the end. That being said, we have a real treat for you. Like I said at the top of the show, we have two serials for you this evening, and this one will be the one that we have in our first act. This serial is... It's really something special, and it is uh, uh, brand new. It's something you've never heard before. So, I encourage you, while this serial is going on, to speculate wildly about where it's going. That's my thought. My question to you is, where is this serial going? What are we going to do with it? Who are these people? What's going on? Uh, put it in the comments, and let's see if we can figure it out together, because the writer isn't telling. Ted!
Attention all employees, this is Site Administrator Eckert with some pressing announcements. We have been having trouble locating SCP-5901, the clown who seeks out people on their birthday to turn their intestines into balloon animals. So please keep your eyes open, especially Dr. Keith Tomlin, to whom I'd like to wish a happy 37th birthday and offer my condolences. Do SCPs escape often? More often than you'd think, less often than I'd like. Now back to your orientation. Our work protects everyday people from the dangers of the unknown, the occult, and the just plain weird. I wouldn't like to be the first to welcome you to your new job here at Site 1313 of the SCP Foundation. You mean you would like to be the first, right? I said what I said. Now, I've gone over your resume. It says you graduated top of your class, and I have a quote, open mind, is that correct? Yes, I do. A truly open mind, like you didn't just put that down as fluff, like when people on Tinder say they like adventures and watching The Office. Do you genuinely mean your mind is open to the possibility that all you've known your whole life is a lie? that the world is a bigger place and scarier than any of your wildest dreams. Yes, I truly mean my mind is open, Admin Eckert. You see, when I was a child, I had a life-changing experience. It was a cold summer before I started seventh grade, and... That's nice, dear. So now that you've, you're a head of finance, there are a few faces you'll need to know. Uh, there's Security Chief Rhonda, she's a right. Uh, Dr. Griswold, our resident psychologist, psychiatrist. And myself, Site Administrator Eckert. If you have any questions... I'm I happy to have at least met one. Don't interrupt me. Don't ever interrupt me. That is the rudest thing you could do to someone. Jesus, what is wrong with you? Who raised you? Sorry. Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I appreciate having a civil and open dialogue with my subordinates. Well, I'm excited to meet new people. That'll change. Your first assignment will be to rework our budget as we seem to be drastically in the red, especially in the maintenance department. Our department in charge of maintaining the containment of our assets. So, I recommend talking to Chet. He is in charge of maintenance staff. See if you can't cut some expenditures. Great. Can do. Can do, Leo. Can do, coo, ka -choo. Finley. Right, sorry. Look, being head of a department for a facility of this nature is no easy task. You need to be ready for anything. I'm reasonably confident that I can handle anything. I mean anything. Psychic octopuses, sentient murder crystals, a giant talking slug who can appear in the form of your greatest sexual desire, named Lorenzo, who you will who will convince you that you deserve better than all of this, that they could give you better than all of this, Ben. In a moment of craziness or mayhap perfect sanity, you share a tender but passionate kiss. That last one seemed... specific. It was romantic, yes. That isn't... okay. Well, I'm going to go talk to Chet now and leave you to, um... leave you. Oh, Lorenzo! Where did I go wrong? Jesus, this place is like a maze. Gotcha! Ah! Ah! Oh my god! Oh my god! Okay, okay, it's not my birthday! Ah, oh, shoot, you aren't 5901. Hey, have you seen like a demon murder clown around here? You mean besides you? Besides me? What are you... Oh, <laughs> you thought because of the, the nose and the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, the big shoes and uh, the, the, the blood stains. Yeah, I wanted to be convincing. See, I'm hunting SCP-5901, and to think like a clown, you gotta think like one. My name's Declan. I'm D-Class personnel. Finley. I'm the new head of finance. Oh, Finley from finance. Good to meet you. Uh, likewise, D-Class Declan. Hey, I don't know if this is rude, but I thought D-Class personnel were all convicts, taken from death row and chipped here to do dangerous grunt work. But you seem... Nice? Yeah, they got me for jaywalking. Really? Jaywalking? That's how you got arrested and placed on death row. Jaywalking. Yeah, they'll put people away for anything these days. 
Uh, any hoodles, uh, Finley from Finance, you seem lost. I am, actually. I'm trying to find Chet from ch- 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 from Maintenance. Yeah, Chet, good dude. He gave me this pack full of stuff to hunt SCP-5901. Oh, that explains the clown disguise and hopefully the blood? Yeah, Chet's office got moved down two flights of stairs. It's in between containment units for their SCP-407, the song that if you hear it, a forest starts growing out of your skin and kills you, and uh, SCP-096, the demon monster that if you look at it for a second will... Kill me? Yeah, how'd you know? Anyway, here, take these uh, noise-blocking headphones and this blindfold. Stairs are right there. Thanks, Declan. You're welcome. Oh, and hey, if you see uh, SCP-5901, tell them there's a surprise party with cake in the quarantine cell. Will do. <laughs> Dope. The surprise isn't actually cake. It's that I'm gonna light it on fire. See ya! saying, Rhonda, is that your security team could stand to do some more training. They are borderline sloppy. And for the love of God, slow down on my yogurt cups. They are my last ones. Um... What? What, 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 what? What is this? What is this? Is this a response? Is this like you're choosing to respond? Huh? I, 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 you, how are you in charge of security? This is a massive, state-of-the-art, top-secret government facility full of nothing but complete and utter professionals. And you sully all of it! You sullier? Why, I bet the next person to enter my office will be at minimum ten times the professional you are! Is this Chet's office? I'm looking for ch Damn it! How many walls does this place need? Ten times, huh? Point taken. Hi! Yes, I am Chet. I don't know if anyone said anything, but I'm gonna take this stuff off now, and if you are some sort of nightmare monster, please, just kill me fast. Hi, I'm Chet. Oh, thank God. I'm Finley from Finance. I'm here to audit your department and see if I can't cut some expenditures. Wonderful! If it's not one thing, it's another with you finance people. You take and you take and you take until I don't have anything left but my sanity and my yogurt cups. Ah, this day couldn't get any better. Probably could. You're out of yogurt cups. <laughs> Rhonda, could you please find another office to bum around in, or better yet, actually go do your job? <sighs> I suppose I could go check and see how the team I sent with Declan is doing catching 5901. I only ran into Declan. He was dressed as a clown and covered in blood that he said he got in a pack from Chet. The pack I gave Declan didn't have a clown suit. Or blood in it. That's... That's probably not good. So, Chet. Yes, I'm Chet, and you're the soul-sucking accountant who won't be happy until you gouge my entire department of its money. <sighs> Let's just get this over with. Well, that is certainly one way to put it. A hurtful way. I'm sorry, it's just I operate with such a slim budget as it is. Come on, Chet, look at some of these allocations. I mean... You're spending 5000 a year on apples. Are you really going to try and convince me that you need $5,000 a year on apples? The apples are critical for the containment of SCP-6018. All right. Thank you for spitting on me. Can you tell me what SCP-6018 is? SCP-6018 is Will Hunting. We provide him with apples so we can ask people what they think of them. 6018 is a Keter class and is very dangerous. Are you telling me we spend $5,000 a year on apples to make an over-two-decade-old movie reference? 
If he doesn't get his answer, his flesh starts to rot, and venomous spores begin to grow out of his bones. He becomes feral, with superhuman levels of strength and speed, now driven by an otherworldly bloodlust. I don't remember that in the movie. It was the director's cut. You can borrow my Blu-ray, unless you want to take that from me, too! No, no, that won't be necessary. I don't even have a Blu-ray player. Let's just move on to the less horrifying allocations, shall we? Hmm, well that narrows us down to less than 0.2% of all the SCPs contained here. Oh my god. So, welcome to your debrief of your first day. How did slashing the maintenance budget go? I did not end up cutting their budget. That's great. Wait, what? I couldn't. Chet went over every cost with me, and I deemed them all necessities, and I deemed myself traumatized. Wonderfuck. Well, family, it seems like you botched the one very simple directive I gave you on your first day. Well, not completely. I found money to cover the deficits in SCP-7309, the giant couch. One of the 0.2% of non-violent SCPs contained here at Site-1313. Really? Yeah, turns out there was a couple billion dollars in loose change between the cushions. So now we can fund maintenance and then some. That's just... so great. You don't seem too happy, Admin Eckert. Totally. I totally didn't want you to slash the budget of our maintenance department in hopes that they would no longer be able to contain all the SCPs, thus creating a massive jailbreak and burning this whole place to the ground while me and Lorenzo watch the embers dance and the people scream. That seems very specific. Like, you've given this thought. A lot of thought. Beforehand. Like, uh, you're kidding, right? Right, Admin Eckert? Right? Say I'm right. You weren't saying I'm right, and that's concerning. Admin Eckert? Well, that puts a lot of things into perspective, doesn't it? I'm glad my job doesn't include any of those dangerous creatures or the weird murder beasts. Or even the couch, which seems unsettling, even if it isn't actively dangerous. So, who knows? Where's that going? Turns out the writer doesn't know, so maybe your suggestions will give him some ideas. Uh, I definitely think we all wanted to know more about each and every one of those SCPs, uh, and I'm very curious to see how much more auditing the, the main character Finley could possibly be doing. So that's... That's going to be interesting. What kind of nightmarish accounting could they possibly... Ugh, ugh. Anyway, speaking of jobs, some of our jobs are absolutely essential and must keep going even during situations like this one. And we want to thank each and every one of you who are going out and doing those essential jobs. It means the world to everyone who is being protected by your uh, time and your efforts out there in the world. We could not do any of this without you. No one could. And for that, everyone here at Starlight Radio Dreams wants to, once again, thank all of the essential workers and all of the healthcare workers who are out there doing their best and fighting the fight. The world thanks you. On a lighter note, let's talk about baking. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to a new daughter podcast on the Showtime Podcast Network featuring the silvery throat of Missy O'Danaher. Dear listeners, you may know me as one who always has an answer and who drives our show to keep going with eager and cheerful readiness that puts the crit in alacrity. But today I'm going to level with you because there are very few answers to be found these days. Attempting to follow shelter-in-place orders after this many weeks is a slow, quiet hellscape of anxiety. Our sense of time is disrupted. Productivity has gone haywire. How is it tough to get moving, yet tough to rest at the same time? I'm here for you folks. Many of you know my job title is Customer Satisfaction Special Agent. But let's be real, satisfaction is in short supply. 
One might compare it to the current stores of hand sanitizer or bathroom tissue or orgasms by human interaction. So let's talk about resilience. Making do. Finding ways to occupy our time, brain, senses, and perhaps get feelings of accomplishment and, dare I say, pleasure? I'm working to put the agency back in special agent. Folks, make your way to the kitchen. It's time for sugar, butter, and carbs. When I'm feeling sluggish, down in the dumps, cranky and lacking in drive, here's what I do. When bad voices try to surround me, it's time to whip up some brownies. I know just what's at stake, so I choose a layer cake The better taste like a dream. That song goes out to all of you, Starlight listeners, with a special shout-out to my love, Inspector Alphonse Dupont. By the way, we have a Zoom meeting at four where you get to watch me eat a biscotti. You're welcome. So hey, Starlight Radio Dreams listeners, we've all got to eat if we're going to get through this. Go feed yourself. And may your delicious nibbles keep you going until we all get to be together again. See? There you go. Baking makes everything better. Speaking of, I'm, that's going to be my segue for the night. Speaking of, on that topic, uh, here we are. Intermission, everyone. We will see you back here in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Tonight's show is produced by Ansel Birch and features the vocal talents of Ansel Birch, Carolyn Blake, Ben McCauley, Rachel Grandegluski, Arnie Parrott, Kat Evans, Ellen DeSitter, Jared McDerris, Michael Jackowitz, and Peter Coparelli. Audio editing brought to you by Ben McCauley, Jared McDerris, and Peter Coparelli, as well as Ansel Birch. And the whole cast and crew wants to issue a special thanks to our friends at Mrs. Murphy and Sons Irish Bistro and to Sure Incorporated for their generous support. Now go out there, enjoy yourselves, keep laughing, and keep dreaming.